Hey there, I'm Cy Brand. I'm Microsoft C++ Developer Advocate, and I'm going to tell you today about what's new in Visual Studio 2022 version 1711 for C++ developers. Starting right off with the standard library, we've made some improvements in our formatted output implementation. Uh, part of this came in C++ 20 with std format, it's just a new and better way of formatting strings. Now in C++ 23, we have printing these formatted strings out to the console. Uh, and it used to be that to print just a new line with std println, you had to pass it an empty string, which is fine, but now you can just call it with no arguments, which is just one of those small things which makes it, it just makes sense. Uh, this was proposed as part of P3142, which is a standards paper that also includes a recipe for banana bread, so definitely read that one. We improved some diagnostics of misuses of the standard library. Uh, for example, std range is two, which converts one range to another. It could be uh, converting a std list to a vector or converting some lazily constructed range into something that's in memory. Uh, in this case, we're trying to convert a vector of strings to just a string, which doesn't make sense because you would need to join the strings together or something first. It used to be that we would say, hey, this program is ill-formed per standards reference, which means now you need to go read the standard to find out what's wrong, and we don't like getting people to do that. So now it tells you what's wrong. Ranges 2 requires the result to be constructible from the source range. We tell you a few ways that it might be constructible from the source range, and then we give you a standards reference. It's much easier to see what's going wrong. Somewhat similarly, uh, std tuple get, so a way of well, getting the el an element out of a tuple. You could pass a, an index, like give me the first or the seventh element of this tuple, or you can say, hey, I want the integer uh, element of this tuple, which is what we do in this case, but that only works if the type which you're requesting is unique. In this case, we have a tuple of two ints, so we say, hey, give me the int from this tuple. Which one do we mean? We don't know, so it's wrong. Uh, we used to say a duplicate type t in get t of tuple, which kind of tells you what's wrong, but it's a bit incorrect because the duplicate type t isn't in the get call, it's in the tuple that you're using. So now we say get t from a tuple of some types requires t to occur exactly once in types, and then gives you a standards reference. Vectorization. We improved the vectorization of several algorithms. Uh, replace copy and uh, copy if, find first of, mismatch, count, find, and iota. Uh, some of these we improved by manually vectorizing them. Some of them we helped the compiler auto vectorize. So if you're using any of these algorithms, you might get some performance improvements. I'm now going to show you a demo of some of the features so you can see them live in action. OK, so this is Open Transport Tycoon Deluxe. If you're not familiar with it, it's a game where you are managing transport between a bunch of cities. So let's generate a world. And it's generated me some land, and a bunch of tarons with random names. Very cool. Now, if you've not played this, would recommend giving it a try. It's really fun. But I've got the code base open here. Let's say we want to look for the code where tarons are generated. We can use the all-in-one search feature up here. Let's generate tarons as a decent enough guess. Yep, yeah, that's what it's called. Um, so new in this version is you can have filter where you're searching. So you can say, I want to search the entire workspace, or just the current project, or just the current document. Uh, you can also toggle searching in external headers or not, which is very handy. All right, so let's go here and see what's going on. So this takes a town layout. What's this? It's an enumerator. And there's a comment here, town layouts. It needs to be eight bits because we save and load it as such. Uh, that's more an implementation detail than documentation, so I still don't really know what this is. Uh, I can ask Copilot now to generate me a description of it. 
It says the town layout is an enumeration in C++ that represents different algorithms for town layout, including original, better roads, 2x2 two two grid, 3x3 three three grid, and random. So a fair bit more helpful there. So if you're in a new code base or looking at a part of the code you've not seen before and there's not sufficient documentation, this can give you uh, a decent idea of what's happening. So we start off, there's initializing a current number for something. We get the difficulty of the game, which is reasonably self-explanatory. And then there's this total. Uh, what What is total? It says if difficulty is equal to custom town number difficulty. So if you have a custom setting for the difficulty, maybe, then you get a custom town number. You can see that it's saying manually entered number of towns. Otherwise, it gets the number of initial towns for the given difficulty and scales it by some random number. So if we if we look at this code, we can work out that this is the total number of towns to generate. Uh, maybe we could have guessed that. It's not the best name for the variable. So we could go ahead and rename it. And now GitHub Copilot does suggest names for the variables. So num initial towns, initial town count, total initial towns, these seem better. So I'm going to pick initial town count, and then you can just apply it like a regular rename change. So this goes and tells us all the places it's going to modify, and we can automatically change it. There we go. Pretty handy. OK, let's look at breakpoints. Say we want to set a breakpoint here, and then run the program. This should hit a breakpoint when we generate a new world. There we go. So note that there's a breakpoint down here. A reasonably new feature is breakpoint groups. So we can say create a new breakpoint group and we'll call it towns and move this breakpoint in here. So now we can group together all of our breakpoint with all of our breakpoints which are involved in town generation. So if we spend a bunch of time working on this feature and then want to go do something else and come back to it, we can just click here to disable all of those breakpoints, but keep them saved. Um, however, if we add new breakpoints, they do just get added into the global scope here. What we can do now is say set as default breakpoint group. And now when we add new ones, they automatically get added into this breakpoint group and we can just toggle them like so. One other improvement we've made is to conditional breakpoints. So conditional breakpoints allow you to set a condition and just write in anything here, like initial town count is less than 100. So then this breakpoint would only get hit if this is true. Or you can say when changed. Uh, the improvement that we've made is actually in performance. If you have these things in like a very tight loop or something, then this condition is going to be evaluated over and over and over. And there was a bit of overhead associated with that. So we've sped this up and it's now about four times faster than it used to be. So if you have a lot, bunch of conditional expressions in very tight loops, hopefully you will see them getting hit faster. Next, I want to show you C++ build insights. This is a way of diagnosing build throughput issues. So you saw there, I went into build, run build insights, and rebuild all. And it's now doing a full rebuild of OpenTTD with um, build insights. So this is going to take a little bit. All right, so the build has succeeded. And now build insights is loading up all of the data that it collected during that build. And it's going to display it to us in a nice big table. Here we go. So this is the included files. There's also views for the include tree for uh, functions and for templates. So this shows us that the standard chrono header took the longest to well added the most time to the build 13 seconds because it was parsed 415 times. One improvement we've added recently is this project filter. So especially if you're using MS build and have a bunch of projects, then you can filter them here. Uh, another improvement we've made is in the grouping 
of these file paths here. So see, we can expand this out and it will show us all of the places in which this header was included. So you can see the debug.h itself was parsed almost 200 times and contributed to six seconds just for this chrono inclusion. So if we, for example, were able to remove the chrono include from debug.h, we would shave off six seconds from the build. We can even then drill even further down into this and see all of the translation units in which this uh, header was used. So there's quite a lot of detail you can get out of this. The last thing I want to show you is GitHub and Azure DevOps pull request support. So I like having lots of towns in this game. So I made a pull request to make even more of them. So if we go over to Git changes here, I call this more towns, I'm just going to discard my current changes. And I have a GitHub pull request for this, which has some review comments in it. So you can see the branch has an active pull request and I can show the comments in the files. So this is now going to show my change. My change was to add a times 1000 here to add many, many more towns. And you can see that my friend has said, Sai, this is too many towns. Um, so I could go ahead and reply here. I could say, you're wrong. I could even type it correctly uh, and then just reply and resolve. But um, maybe let's let's check it out. Let's see if if this is indeed too many towns. So I can say a new game. I'm just generating the normal number of towns. And this is going to hit my breakpoint, of course. So let's just disable all of these and continue. And 23,000. Yeah, maybe that is too many towns. All right, so these are all of the features that I just showed you. Code search scoping, quick info and rename suggestions in Copilot, auto adding breakpoints to the default group. I mentioned conditional breakpoint performance. I showed you build insights and GitHub and Azure DevOps PR comments. A few more new features I want to mention before we wrap up. For those targeting Unreal Engine and using Visual Studio, there's a few new features. Uh, we have this new add Unreal Engine class wizard. So if you right click on your project in the Solution Explorer, you can add an Unreal Engine class through a wizard rather than having to create all the files and all the templating stuff yourself. Similarly, if you're wanting to create UE modules, there's a wizard for that too. And finally, there is a new Unreal Engine toolbar, which collects a bunch of useful UE features like attaching to an Unreal Engine process or rescanning your blueprints or accessing the Unreal Engine log all from one toolbar. The last thing I want to mention for CMake is the CMake debugger. We've had this for a while. Um, if you hit that configure cache with CMake debugging, then it will generate your CMake project and use the Visual Studio debugger to let you set breakpoints, step through the code, visualize your locals, see any errors which come up. This can be really handy in diagnosing those kind of tough CMake errors that you might get in your project. But importantly, this is now available for Linux. So if you're, say, targeting WSL um, or a remote Linux system from Visual Studio, then you can now use the CMake debugger just like you would on Windows. And that is everything I wanted to show you today. If you'd like to download the most recent version, you can use the Visual Studio installer, or you can go to aka.ms slash Visual Studio. Thanks very much for joining, and I'll see you next release.